So here's some roles that are really nice to have in the contracting and consulting world flex that I've seen. A mediator, someone who can bridge the gap between engineering and design, right? A mediator is a guy who can sit between them and talk to them and bring those two teams together and have them have a decent dialogue. And that can just be you, you know, re-saying it in front of a project manager even though they didn't actually talk, right? You need to be <clears throat> someone who can understand what engineers say and then you can go to the designer and go, look, that's not possible, but here's how we can make it work. What about these ideas, right? Typically, engineers are viewed as the fund governors, and the designers are like way up here, you know, impossible, right? That's not true. You just need somebody to bridge the gap, talk to them, and, you know, say, look, from the project manager, talk to them, for example. Say, look, they want this. I agree with this. This is going to cost X amount of time, but I really feel it's a good idea. And we can reallocate resources. Someone who can mediate that gap, understand the different disciplines, and bring them together. It's a very, very highly prized role in rich internet applications because you have designers, developers, interaction designers, usability people, tech writers, all of this amalgamation of somehow to talk to each other and they're from different you know, worlds. So really helps someone to talk through that. The architect. Uh, architects are your classic J2EE guys, your .NET guys who just, yeah, you're going to build the, your three-tiered architecture with your database and your on Apache and you know, all that stuff. The guys who say, this is how it's built. That could be an architect that's just on the front end, or it could be an architect on the back end, but typically architects are just really good at making maintainable applications, uh, or they're good at making, like in the Flash world, especially in the designer agency world, they're good at making applications, but they're, they're good at doing it such a way that they, they understand the ramifications of those decisions and can effectively communicate them, right? So a project manager knows what they're going into by choosing paths that you recommend. So an architect is a really prized role. A manager. Do you have any experience in managing other people? There you go. If you do, fantastic. Most important thing a contractor and or consultant, being independent, can do is you got to have good leadership skills. It's one thing to say, you know, let's say you're going through a jungle, right, and you're hacking down, and a manager is really good at saying, all right, everyone get in a line, take your machetes, let's go this way, right? All in a line, we can walk behind the big, strong guys in the machetes. You know, a manager can effectively communicate, make sure everyone's going the right direction. A leader will climb, the, climb up a, the nearest palm tree and say, guys, we need to go that way, not that way. That's a leader. Can you go into a team of individuals and lead them and provide the direction they need and make them feel comfortable and inspired to work on what they're doing? That's a leader. And if you can do that, it's a very effective skill to have. So let's talk about the negative things, the best, the best things. Uh, Work-life work balance, OK? Uh, a lot of people talk about work-life balance because a lot of, I would say, independent contractors are workaholics, and actually they have problems balancing work and life. They have families, you know, they're normal people just like the rest of us, but they have problems doing it. So on-site consulting is uh, something you got to keep in mind if you're actually on-site with a client. You actually live in Arizona and you have to fly to New York. Okay, that's on-site consulting. Uh, telecommuting is a way to sometimes balance that, uh, but it has cost your telecommuting from what, home? Or so you're really at home or you're working from home, right? And then family. What's most important? Is it family to you? Is that what you identify as most important? How do you balance that with work, which requires a significant amount of your time? Because family requires a lot of time, too. How do you balance that? So let's talk about on-site consult on consulting is really when you travel to and or work from a client's location. So if you actually, uh, let's say, fly to New York, maybe they set you up a temporary office you know, in their, their place, or maybe they just say, uh, just work on your laptop and uh, we'll just come in for a meeting for a day, right? So that would still be on, considered on-site consulting, but you are working from there. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's temporary office, so you can't really put up decorations too much. Maybe they gave you a table and a chair, or maybe just <laughs> they said, here's your laptop and here's a couch, ready to go. Uh, or there's a coffee shop over there. I mean, I've, I've been to all, all of those. Um, a lot of times you're living out of a hotel. Can you live out of a hotel for weeks on end? You know, maybe only getting to go home in the weekends. Sometimes not at all. Can, can you do that? Are you capable of just you know, packing your clothes and living out of a hotel? You don't have your special toothbrush, or maybe you do. You don't have your special bed. It's just some alien place. You know, that's, that's hard for some people to do on-site consulting. Uh, there's another way that a lot of co specifically contractors like to work, and that's telecommuting. Consultants do it too, but consultants a lot of times have to go on-site first to establish the rapport with the team, to understand the needs more clearly, recognize who's on board, you know, understand how the stakeholders communicate. That's, that's good to go, right? So telecommuting is nice. You basically work from home is what it usually means, but it doesn't have to be. It just means you don't work at work. The first thing people think about telecommuting is if you're not at work, you must not be working. That's incorrect. Proximity does not equal productivity. 
Just because I'm not at work does not mean I'm working, and it does not mean I'm productive. And that's the same for a lot of other telecommuters. They can do very well. Some people are not good working from home or anywhere else not at work. They need to that discipline of being in the office, to have managers there, to have other people working, to have desks. They, that structure is something they need. Some of us don't need it. Uh, another thing is travel and accommodations are typically paid for by the client. Sometimes, in a, a rare case, if you're going to, let's say, a lower price, price client or maybe it's an uh, emergency project, it went downhill and you're you know, required to come in and save it, a lot of times they, they'll almost always, in my experience, they paid for travel and accommodations. Conferences are a little different, but that's typically how it goes down. It's the norm. You've got to understand, though, your time working, you've got to take into account that you're not working while you're traveling. <clears throat> now, some people say, I can work at the airport on wireless okay, well, why is occasionally connectivity applications coming out? It's because we don't always have wireless. We don't always have a comfortable environment to work in, right? So <clears throat> you should assume that your time traveling is not spent, spent working. This is how you should assume it is. So let's talk about the savings of telecommuting. And a lot of people have, like, issues with telecommuting. It's always hard in consulting. You've got to go, you go there ahead of time and establish the rapport with the client. Say, look, uh, you know, I typically telecommute but I always come on site the first week or two, understand the team, understand what we need, you know, just figure out who's involved and let's establish a, a friendship, right, professional. The first thing we say is, look, telecommuting saves money, okay? Here's an example. When I was in Detroit for three months, uh, it was about anywhere from 250 to 300 night hotels, sometimes 150, it just depends on, you know, if it was local to work. So let's say five nights, that's $1,250, okay? Then you get around $30, day, $30 a day for food. I mean, sometimes more, sometimes less, depends on where you eat. That's 150 bucks in five days. Then you have a three-month gig, maybe two months. I mean, keep in mind, these, a lot of these can last over time. They're looking for you to provide leadership. That's like $17,000 for three months versus let me come in for two weeks, maybe about 3000 bucks. plane tickets, travel, accommodations, right? It doesn't even count travel accommodations for Delta or whatever. We just come in for two weeks, establish a poor, and then I'll work from home the rest of it. That'll save you, you know, anywhere from ten to $20,000. Most clients would be like, most big clients, they don't care. They drop you know, $2 million on an Oracle license like that, and they just don't care. So sometimes it works. It just depends on the client size. So the comp, there's some compromises you can make to deal with on-site consulting. Sometimes you can say, look, if I'm going to work here for five days a week, let me leave early on Fridays, OK? I, you know, I, work a little, I come in here early on Monday because you know, I actually flew in Sunday night. Then let me just leave early on Friday. I'll get, make sure my stuff's done. Because I got to travel to the airport and everything else and get back home for my wife, you know, or your significant other, whatever. Some clients are cool with that. You do your work, you do a good job, they'll let you leave Friday. Another thing you can do is leave Thursday, like Thursday night, and you can work from home Friday. So you, you don't have a three day weekend, you're still working, but you're telecommuting on Fridays, so you don't have to worry about the hustle and bustle of Fridays, right? It's just been on, on a lot of cities, always nasty on Friday. So you can work from home. Some people say you can come in late on Mondays. And that way it compensates for the whole Friday thing. That way they have their Sunday, right? Because if you're coming in early on Monday, if it's, you know, you have to fly or drive a long way, it's assumed that you did that Sunday night. I mean, you spent half your day packing, getting ready, and traveling. So you don't really get a two-day weekend. That's lame sauce. So a lot of people, they would say, oh, leave on Monday. I don't like that. I'd rather just go half Sunday and then work from home Friday. Frankly, I like to work from home all the time, but that's just how it is. Working from home, is it really work? Can you work from home? I mean, if you've got your Xbox, your Wii, and your computer there that has games on it, but you also work on it too, is that an environment where you can focus? Is that an environment that you, know, you can really do work from? Um, you know, a lot of people are very good at that. They can focus very well and then you know, turn, or they can work for an hour, play a game, go back for an hour, and they get their stuff done. It just depends on you know, who you are and what you got uh, working on. The problem is, though, is it really your home? Some people really view their home as their place of zen, of their place of comfort, where they can go to escape their day and recuperate and rejuvenate for tomorrow. You know, that's their thing. Some people, like, whatever, it's just a room. You know, they, they, they can turn off the switch and then turn back on just walking around. So you need to keep that in mind. Do you really want to bring work home, right? Can you, can you handle that? Do you have the support of your family? <clears throat> I've read a lot of consultants and contractors who've said, the expectation is of my family that when I close my door, I'm working. Daddy's working and no one comes in. And that's just the way it is. That's not how it works at my house. My door is always knocked on. I'm always requested. The dogs always bark. 
There's always somebody at the door delivering more yarn for my wife. I mean, it's just very, very distracting, right? I can do it one or two days, but it's just, you know, it's hard to keep, keep that track. Some people have the discipline in their family, you know, like hardcore. My wife walks all over me, so it just depends on, you know, if you can do that. You need to get the support of your family to make it happen. The other, it, and this isn't spiritual at all. This is just negative energy, okay? If you have a bad day, do you subconsciously associate your house or that room that your office is in with your bad day? I do. If I have a bad day and I walk into that room, I immediately my mind starts thinking about work and the negative things that happened or you know, a client who didn't pay or you know, for another 60 days or something. And that negative karma, that negative energy from that room affects me. I'm in my house. Is that acceptable? Is that acceptable to have that negativity in your house? Some people, they're really good at just turning it off or going to play a game or not associating that, you know, putting it back in their mind. People like me who are very emotional, I, you know, I, I, I feel that negativity. So a lot of times, <clears throat> if you can leave it at Starbucks, you know, or another Starbucks that you don't typically go to with your friends, that's a great way of doing it. Or your office, you can leave that stuff at work. So you got to be careful when setting up home offices. Some people, it works great. I can do it about half a week. I'm good to go. I love it. I couldn't do it another five days a week. Couldn't do it. 